We have seen two important higher order functions on this map and filter. And we also saw that filter and map are usually often used together in order to produce interesting transformations on a list. So a filter takes a list, applies a property and extracts those elements which satisfy the property and map takes a list and applies a function to each element of the list. So by combining map and filter, you can select some items from a list and then transform only those items. So today we will look at a nice notation for doing this, which is much more readable than just writing map and filter. So we start with basic set theoretic notation. So we have often seen this kind of notation to describe a set. Okay? So here it says take given a set capital L, take all elements from the L which satisfy some condition, in this case they are even, and square these elements. So this is a set of all x squared such that x belongs to L and x is even. So effectively this takes a given set L and produces a new set M. So it transforms a given set to a new set, right? And this, in set theory, this notation is called set comprehension. So this is a technical term. So defining sets in this way is defined to be using a technique called set comprehension, right? So this is just terminology from set theory. So analogous to this, Haskell allows us to define lists using list comprehension. So this notation, looks very similar to that. Instead of a curly bracket, we have a list square bracket. Okay. And then we have, of course, the same vertical bar, which is the symbol from, you can type on the keyboard. And now for the element of, we use this thing which resembles element of. So remember we said that Haskell tries to use notation which looks like what we use in real life. So we use slash equal to for not equal to, right? And now we have already seen that we use this minus and greater than to sim simulate the arrow for a function. And now we have less than and minus, which is supposed to represent the element of. So this says for a, take the elements in L, check if they are even. So this is a filter. And then if they are even, apply x square. So this is a map. So here is an example. So supposing we want to find the divisors of n. The divisors of n are those numbers that divide n without leaving any remainder. So the first of all, the first thing to note is the divisors of n must be in the range 1 to n. So we take all elements in the range 1 to n. And if the remainder when n is divided by that number is 0, so x divides n exactly, then we list it. Right? So this lists all the divisors of n. So if I take, for example, divisors of, say, 6, then I'll first generate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of the possible candidates. And then applying this condition, we'll say that 6 divided by 1 is okay. 6 divided by 2 is okay. 6 divided by 3 is okay because 6 mod 3 is 0. 6 divided by 4 is not okay. 6 divided by 5 is not okay. 6 divided by 6 is okay. So exactly the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 6 will survive. Now using this function divisors, we can classify whether a number is prime or not, right? So primes below a given number n. So a prime is a number which is divisible by only itself and 1. So if a prime, if a number is prime, like divisors of 7, you will get a list consisting of 1 and 7 and nothing else because that's the definition of prime. That the only two integers that divide the number are the number itself and 1. It has no other non-trivial factors. So in order to check whether something is prime or not, we just check whether divisors of x is exactly the list 1 comma x. And then we take all the numbers from 1 to n such that this is true and we list them out, we get the primes below the number in the range 1 to n, or 2 to n rather. Because notice that if I say <coughs> 1, see 1 is not a prime. Divisors of 1, by the way we have defined it, is going to be the list consisting of 1. So it will fail this test because it is not 1 comma 1, which is what this test requires. It requires divisors of x to be the list 1 comma x. So in order for 1 to be a prime, it would have to produce a list of divisors of form 1 comma 1, but our function divisors will not do that. It will only check one number and produce that number. So divisors of 1 will just be the list containing the single element 1. So we are okay that 1 doesn't come out as a prime. 2 on the other hand will give the list of divisors 1 comma 2 and so on. 
So far we have seen examples where you, we use only one generator, but we can use more than one generator. So what this says is, let x run through the list 1 to 10, let y run through the list 1 to 10, and construct the list of all pairs x, y that are generated by combining these values of x and y. So this is saying something like, for each x in the range 1 to 10, for each y in 1 to 10, produce x, y. Right? So therefore, if I fix a value x equal to 1, then it will generate every possible y. Then for x equal to 2, it will generate every possible y and so on. So the later generators move faster. So I have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, up to 1, 10. So x is fixed as 1, and y will run through 1 to 10. Then x will move to 2. Again, y will move from 1 to 10. And finally, we will get, of course, 10, 10. Right? So when we have multiple generators, the generators to the right are executed or they are run through for each element of the generators to the left. So here, for example, is a way to generate all pairs. So remember Pythagoras' formula. Okay, so if we want integers to satisfy the function, x, the relation x squared plus y squared equal to z squared up to a certain upper limit, then uh, we can run x from say 1 to 100, y from 1 to 100, z from 1 to 100, and check that x times x plus y times y is equal to z times z, and extract all of these. So this is using our list comprehension and multiple generators, we can generate all the Pythagor Pythagorean tuples. But if you see this, notice that 3, 4, 5 is a Pythagorean triple. So it will be generated by this when we run it. But then later on when x becomes 4, then we will also generate 4, 3, 5. Right? So this actually generates duplicates. Right? So we get 3, 4, 5 and we also get 4, 3, 5. So supposing we don't want to list these separately because these are essentially the same triple, it's just in a different order, then we can be a little more careful in our generator. So generators can actually, just as we said that for every x, y is generated and for every y, z is generated, the values that we generate for y can depend on the current value for x. So what we can say is that we always want to generate these in the order x less than or equal to or strictly less than y, strictly less than z. So x runs from 1 to 100, but for each value of x, I only check y's from x plus 1 words, and I only check for z's from y plus 1 onwards. So this gives us a set of triples without any duplicates, because now I will get 3, 4, 5, but once I set x to 4, I cannot generate 3, because y will start from 5. So here is another function using written, rewritten using list uh, comprehension. Remember the function concat, it dissolves brackets. So if I have concat of say 3, 7, empty list and 4, 6, then what this does is it produces from this a list 3, 7, 4, 6. Okay. So we are taking a list of lists and producing a single list by this collapsing all of them into a single list and if it's empty, it just gets left off. So this says, okay, concat of L, well, for, for you take each element in L. So I take this, then I take this, then I take this. So Y will be first this, then Y will be this, then Y will be this. And now I take each X and Y. So X now is this, then this, then this, and then this. So these are the values that X takes and output all of these as one list, right? So it takes every y in the inner list, takes every element of that list and extracts it as an outer element. So therefore this dissolves one level of brackets and behaves exactly like concat. So let's just look at a couple of more, uh, slightly more exotic examples. So supposing we want to take a list of lists and extract all the even length non-empty lists, right? So if I take something like this, So this is a list of lists. Now this has length 1, this has length 0, length 1, length 2, length 3. But I don't want this, so I only want to extract 6, 8. Right? So I want to extract all the even length non-empty lists in a given list. So the new thing here is that, okay, so the filter that we want is we want to take the list of lists 
check each element in the list and extract it provided its length is even. Remember that length in anything being even is just checking the remainder with respect to 2. So we just want to take the length of the given list divided by 2 and check whether the answer is 0 or not. Okay, But <coughs> one important feature here is we want non-empty lists only. And the way we can do non-empty lists in one shot in this list comprehension is by providing a pattern here which only matches non-empty lists. So this says don't take every element of L, only take those elements of L which are of the form x colon xs. In other words, in our earlier example, if we saw empty list as a given element in the list of lists, then this pattern won't match. So it will just skip it. Right? So for every non-empty list in L, check if its length is even and if so, then put out that list. Now, given that we have this pattern, we also have the structure of the list. So we can extract not just the entire list, but any part of it. So supposing we want to modify this slightly to say, we don't want all the entire non-empty list. We want the head of the even length list. Okay? So this is again non-empty. So then it's simple enough. We just take exactly the same right hand side. We check first of all that it's non-empty by putting the pattern x colon x is uh, in L. We use mod to check that the length is even. But now we don't take the entire list. We use this pattern to extract only the head of it. So you can, the message from this example is that when we write a generator, it's not just a simple variable, we can actually use a pattern and use that pattern to generate elements of it. So list comprehensions are essentially just syntactic conveniences for us. It's not a fundamental concept, it's just a, a way of writing map and filter in a more readable format which is very similar to set theory notation and easy to uh, decode rather than nested maps and filters. And in fact, you can formally translate this comprehension using map, concat and a version of filtering. So list comprehension typically has this form. You have an output expression which is generated by a bunch of input conditions. So each of these is either a Boolean condition or it is a generator. And in the generator, we have patterns. So we can either say P belongs to L or B. And when we apply a condition B, it applies to the things which have been generated before it. So a Boolean condition acts as a filter. So if I have an expression of the form E such that B followed by Q, then this is an expression which is allowed in Haskell, which we have not seen before. So we can write a, this is an expression in Haskell written using the convention if then else. So it says if B is true, then this is the output. Otherwise, this is the output. So in other words, for whatever list I'm generating, okay, if B holds, then I continue to apply the remaining things. Otherwise, I, I just skip it. So for each element, in, implicitly this applies to the things that have been generated on the left. So if the le element from the left satisfies the condition, then I continue to process it using what remains. Otherwise, I drop it. And what about generators? So generators produce lists of candidates. So if I have a generator, then I need to take each element of P and apply this E such that Q to it. Right? So I map each element of P with this function. So it's map F of L, where F of P is E such that Q. And if P is not matched, so this is because it's a pattern, then I don't do it. Right? So this is taking care of the fact that this is a pattern. So if the pattern itself doesn't match, if there's not a pattern, I wouldn't have this case. If it just said for elements, I would just have f of x is e such that q. But since I have a pattern, it says if the pattern matches, then do something. The pattern doesn't match, skip it. Now, this is a naive translation, and we will see why. So, so far, we have not used concat. We have used map, and we have used a kind of filtering before this. So, let's look at an example to see why this goes wrong. So let's look at the simple example. Supposing we want to square all the even numbers between 1 and 7. So we generate all the numbers from 1 to 7, check if they are even, and then square them. Okay. So now the first thing that we have is a generator. So we have to apply the map thing. So it says map f to 1 to 7, where f of n is what remains. That is this and this. Okay. So this is that e colon q. 
any such set P. Okay. And now we have to inductively recover this. So this is a property. So this will be replaced by an if then else. So it says map f to 1 from to the list 1 to 7, where f of n is if n is even, then n square, the list containing n square, else the empty list. And now, if we apply this to each element, then for 1 we get the empty list, for 2 we get the list containing 4 and so on. So you will notice that what we would expect from this list is we will expect 2 squared, 4 squared and 6 squared. So in other words, we will expect the list 4, 16, 36 to be the output of this list comprehension. But we actually get this complicated expression with a lot of spurious brackets. And this is precisely why we need the concat. We need to ex eliminate these brackets. So the correct translation of the generator is to insert a concat here. So we don't just map f to n. We take the resulting output and we dissolve one level of brackets. So the result of removing a generator from this expression is to concat the result of mapping f to the list. And now if we do this, everything works out fine for that example and you can check that it works in general. So we take the same list n squared such that n is from 1 to 7 and n is even. So after one expansion we have this map but now we have this concat in front of it. So after the second expansion we have this if but we still have this concat in front of it. So now we get concat of this earlier expression that we had and now the concat dissolves these brackets and removes the empty list. So I just get 4, 16 and 36 which is the expected output. So let's now look at the example that we had in the introduction to the introductory video to the course. So this is the sieve of Eratosthenes. So what does the sieve of Eratosthenes do? It generates all the possible prime numbers. So the strategy is the following. You start with the list of all numbers beginning with 2 because the first prime is 2. So the leftmost number at the list at any point is the next prime. And once we enumerate a prime, we remove all its multiples from the list because they are no longer candidates to be primes. So let's just see how this would work. So supposing we start with this infinite list of which we have written a finite prefix. So we have up to 20. So now the first number in this list is the first prime, namely 2. So we mark 2 as a prime and now we must remove all its multiples from the list. So the first multiple of 2 is 4, the next is 6, 8 and so on. So we go through this infinite list knocking off all the even numbers. So this gives us a resulting list in which the first number that is left is 3. So 3 is now a prime. So we knock off its multiples. So 6 is already knocked off, but we will knock off 9. 12 is already knocked off, but we'll knock off 15, 18 is already knocked off, but we'll knock off 21 and so on. So after knocking off multiples of 3, we've also got rid of 9 and 15. And of course, a, a lot of numbers to the right, which we don't see in this. So now the next prime is a 5. And then we will knock off 10, 15, 25, and 20, 25, and so on. So this is the process by which we generate the primes. So of course, in this, we have several infinite processes. First of all, we have to start with an infinite list and every time we pick out the first element, we have to remove all its multiples. So that's again an infinite process because we have to go through this infinite list and mark off all the multiples. Nevertheless, as we claimed in the introductory video, we can write this using this intuitive notation which says apply the sieve to the list, infinite list 2 onwards. Remember by lazy notation, this is the list 2, 3, 4 and so on because of lazy evaluation this can this makes sense and the resulting of the result of applying sieve to a list is to extract the first element as a prime and then remove all multiples of that element from the list so if I take all the this the tail of the list for every y I keep it only if it doesn't get divided evenly by x and then I recursively apply sieve to that Okay, so this is succinctly describing the sieve algorithm. It says take the list 2 onwards and apply sieve to it where sieve extracts the first element, removes all its multiples from the tail and applies sieve recursively to that tail. So if we look at the way that this evaluates, it will actually make sense. So we say that set of primes is the result of applying sieve to 2 onwards. So sieve to 2 onwards says take out the first element and apply sieve to 3 onwards 
okay, such that the elements don't divide. Too. Now this in turn will say extract the first element of this. So the first element of this happens to be 3. So it will say apply sieve to 3 and the rest. Okay, so this is just saying that if I expand this inner list of this comprehension, then this produces 3 followed by 4 onwards with the same property. Now having done this, I got the first element. So sieve will extract it out. And then it will say apply sieve to the result of this original list, which we already, this is the list that is currently running. Okay, so we take every element in that list and apply another condition to it. So once again, if we do this two nested list comprehensions, the first element that comes out will be 5. Right? And so now after we extract the 5, then it will say, okay, take the inner list that we are already working with with two list comprehensions and apply a third one. Right? So this is the way that the SIP function gets rewritten. And as it is rewritten, we get more and more primes. So do write this out for yourself in GHC and verify that it does generate primes. So this is not necessarily the most efficient way to generate primes. In fact, it is not the most efficient way to generate the primes, but it is certainly an interesting exercise which says that a very direct implementation is possible because of a combination of this list comprehension notation and lazy evaluation. Of course, lazy evaluation is crucial, otherwise we cannot work with infinite lists at all. But using lazy evaluation and using list comprehension, we can write a very succinct two or three line implementation of a very basic algorithm in such a way that it's immediately obvious what's going on and it does the expected thing. So what we have seen is that we often use map and filter together and list comprehension is a succinct and readable way of combining these functions so that we can directly understand what's going on. But list comprehension is not in itself a new piece of notation in Haskell. It's merely what is called syntactic sugar. It's just an easy to read form of something that can be described directly using concat, map and filter.